Welcome to the garden party. Ideas on outdoor living coming up next. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home. Now in today's show, we're going to take a look at some ways that you can make the most of all the space around your home for outdoor living. It doesn't matter whether you live in an apartment with a balcony or a deck, or a farm with acres and acres, it's all about outdoor living and making the most of it. And no matter the size space you live in, everyone likes to kick back and enjoy the work they put into their garden spaces. So we're going to take a look at some ideas that will help you relax, entertain, and unwind with people you enjoy spending time with. You know, when it comes to outdoor entertaining, there's a lot of work involved. You can create quite a checklist for yourself. So I'm always looking for ways to enhance outdoor spaces in the simplest, easiest way. Now take a deck or a patio, for instance. If you want to change out your containers and do something that's really bold and dramatic, go simple. Take one plant variety and pack it out in a container, just as they've done here with this wonderful peacock kale. You see, these plants are easy to grow, and I mean really tough. And when you use them abundantly like this, well, you can create some real visual impact. You see, I think it's much more effective to build out with one kind of plant and spread it around rather than having lots of different kinds of things going on. Make it easy on yourself. If you're going to have guests over, you don't want a long list of things to have to do. You want to enjoy yourself. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, when it comes to having a party in my garden, I can get into getting the garden ready, planning up all the containers, planning the food and so forth, but the thing I always forget about is getting the invitations out. It's always difficult for me for some reason. It's the first thing you ought to do, but it's the thing I do the very last. So I thought it might be interesting for us to check in with a graphic artist who specializes in creating party invitations. When choosing an invitation, the color comes into play in many ways. If people are throwing an outdoor party, something casual, they want bright colors, pinks, greens, that's a really popular color combination. This is a fun beach party. Flip-flops are huge. People associate summertime fun with anything that has a flip-flop on it. When you throw any kind of party, it's great to send the invitation. This is for a cookout, just backyard party, but the people that get invited feel like they're going to something special. And when they go out, the people that receive them know if it's going to be a casual party, a formal party, based on the graphics, the color, the overprint type, and it just, in general, gets everyone excited about the party before they even get there. So much inspiration can come from the garden. Maybe that's just one of the reasons artists are always drawn to its beauty. One art form that I really admire is that of pressed flowers. It's great because you can pick and preserve the flowers in the spring and summer and use them year-round, even in the middle of winter or on rainy days. And that's exactly what pressed flower artist Thaley Cullander does when she creates these impressive works of art. This is a flower press. It's just two pieces of plywood with toggle bolts on. You just put them on this paper that helps absorb the moisture and let them, let them dry for about two weeks. I see this, this piece right here and already I can see now, I can already start having a feel for um, designing I'll take my little piece of fern and I'll get one of my little one of my little roses and maybe add a little handsy to it. And you've got to have a little have a little squiggle coming out. Now the next step is after I've designed this, I'll start gluing. And then when you're through, you have to always put your name on it.
Setting the stage for a garden party is a little bit like infusing your everyday life with some drama. Think about taking your garden and looking at it like a theater set. Okay, so maybe you wouldn't hang lanterns and drape fabric, but it is a lot of fun and it makes your guests feel really welcome. Earlier today, I caught up with the designer of this garden, April Gonzalez, and she shared with us some of the key elements that make this garden so successful. April, what a fantastic space. It feels so much more expansive than it really is. Why, thank you, Alan. We worked really hard on developing this axial view. The idea was to take the eye out into the garden, but then get the feet to follow. Yeah, well, I mean, what a great place for entertaining. Uh, it's so welcoming. It's really about creating intimate spaces, bringing friends by and allowing them to gain a sense of refuge. There are a lot of little places in the garden where you can go with someone or with your favorite friend and have a conversation or just relax and refresh and renew. And that's really how the garden is used. It was my main goal when I originally laid it out. You know, April, what's interesting about this garden is you step out onto the back lawn and you look across this expanse and you think, well, I see everything. But as you move through the garden, you actually realize, aha, there's a tiny little secret garden tucked away. Mm -hmm. We've sort of disguised it with the hydrangeas and you're never gonna notice the entranceway looking down the garden. You really have to be in the garden. And then it is, it's a great surprise. It's like something children would like, like a cave or going under a tree limb in an old old oak tree and you immediately are invited right in. You're almost pulled right in. As soon as the eye sees it, you hear the bubbling water, you want to sit on the edge of that pond and stick your finger in and see if any frogs have come by. Now in the front, you have a wonderful focal point. It's that urn with the cycad and the plectrantha spilling out of it. It's a beautiful combination. Well, Alan, I have a confession to make. That is where the contractor put the manhole cover to the dry well. And as a landscape designer, I'm offended by it, but if I apply, let's say, the Mel Brooks theory of make it completely obvious, we put a planter on it, we glorify it, and it just happened to be in perfectly the right spot for that. Well, it's interesting how a single object, such as an urn and a bit of lawn, can really organize a space. It's true, and there is actually more structure up front. One of my goals with the opening of the garden, sort of the entrance to the garden, was not to completely close out the neighborhood. He wanted privacy. He likes the idea of entering into a courtyard. And we've tried to create that, especially with the central planting, with the old boxwood. We were very fortunate in having old material on the property that we could move around just prior to construction. But I wanted the neighborhood to still share in the garden a little bit. So we've made these sort of peekaboo look through curved hedges. There's a, an S-curve, a recurved hedge, where you see parts of a perennial garden and you can see his apple in bloom. And so I don't close out the world, but I do create a sense of enclosure and privacy that way. Well, I think the cadence that you've created along the mixed border is really marvelous because you have a real rhythm going on there between the deciduous and evergreen shrubs. Well, I think gardening is also like good writing. You need punctuation. You need those places to pause. Now, this is a year-round garden, so the evergreens make a really good border on the south for screening, which is one of my favorite ways of using them. Privet can be a little stiff also, but we have a variation in texture, in color, between fall coloring and summer flowering that goes on along this whole border. That's really very satisfying. Well, you've obviously used quite a palette of plants here, but what's wonderful is there is a continuum of the same types of plants, particularly along the mixed border. Mm -hmm. You have the yews which create this continuum and I think gives the visitor comfort. We feel comfortable with structure. I love geometry, and it is in all my gardens. For example, this curve along the back was very specifically laid out. We actually went up onto the upper deck to make sure that we had it right. I've been up on the upper deck more times than once getting that curve right because it's so important to him. He could see where an inch was off. And if that inch is off, it's like having a thread pulled in your clothing or something that you're sitting on, a princess in the pea kind of effect, <laughs> where you're just not relaxed. And we really need that in the garden. So in some ways I have to emphasize meticulous details, but I don't want to frighten people. This is not a high maintenance garden. We have banks of impatience, hydrangeas, rhododendrons, real workhorse plants. Now on the other hand, I don't want to scare you off from experimenting because every year we review this garden. 
the design process has been continual. And I don't know about you, but when I go shopping, I frequently see things that I think that client is just going to love. I really like the pair of chairs that you have in the secret garden. That actually is something that he found on his own with no help from me whatsoever, but he does sit in them and he just watches the water flow. And that's part of the relaxing element of this garden that we very purposely built into it. Okay, now I'd like to take you to a few gardens that I've designed that we've set up for outdoor entertaining. Nestled along the banks of a river is this home, which belongs to a couple passionate about their garden. I've been working with them for years, and it was an honor recently to attend their annual martini party celebrating the bloom of the Chinese fringe tree. This is a great garden for entertaining, and along the back of the house, we had some fun with a little before and after. I transformed their garden from this to this. We brought in white furniture with blue and white cushions and an umbrella. And we had a lot of fun with containers, such as these blue glazed pots filled with purple fountain grass. We found some whimsical blue glass serving plates to add a little sparkle to the table. In fact, the whole blue theme sprang from some art hanging in the couple's kitchen. You know, I always think it's great when you can take inspiration from inside the house and let it spill over to the outside. Okay, how about another garden home transformation? These homeowners have collected some handsome sculpture over the years that serve as focal points in the garden. A generous patio allows you to appreciate them from all angles, and it also serves as the perfect place for entertaining. I was able to rearrange some of the furnishings they already had to help them create an outdoor dining room for a garden party. Grouping pieces together, like the table and chairs and the serving side tables, gives this patio a room-like feeling. Plants, candles, and accessories fill the space, making it an inviting place for dining al fresco. Now here's another space I've transformed. Here I use the chimney of native stone as a focal point. The homeowners already had some beautiful vintage furnishings, so we cleared the space and set it like an outdoor living room. I can imagine the family having their morning coffee here and reading the paper or relaxing with friends after dinner. The indoor-outdoor rug gives the room some boundaries and the new arrangement of furnishings creates a more intimate space surrounding the focal point, that rustic chimney. I accented the arrangement with containers spilling over with geraniums and ivy. And by exchanging the wall plaque they had with one slightly larger, we were able to draw the eye into the space. And even the family dog agrees. Now for a touch of drama, it's hard to beat this pool house. These lemon yellow and white striped curtains just scream, hey, it's summer, the pool's open. You know, there's such a huge range of outdoor fabrics to choose from these days. Virtually any color, pattern, or weave that you can find for inside, there's a comparable fabric that can be used outdoors. These fabrics are a great way to create a comfortable and festive atmosphere. It seems like more and more people enjoy putting together party favors that their guests can take home with them. Let me share with you a few ideas that are perfect for a party with a garden theme. Like using inexpensive glass vases that can be purchased in bulk at discount or hobby stores for making a small cut flower arrangement for each place setting. At the end of the night, you can invite your friends to take these home as a reminder of the lovely evening spent dining in the garden. During the summer, it's fun to have an heirloom tomato tasting party. These are delicious and everyone loves it. Tie raffia ribbon and seed packets around a cloth napkin for your guests to take home for planting next season. Now when my bees produce a bountiful harvest of honey, I like to share it with those who visit my garden. I even came up with my own label. Now of course honey isn't the only thing that bees produce. Beeswax is another byproduct of the process and it's perfect for making handmade candles. What a perfect party favor to send home with guests and it's really easy to do. Let's step into my garden and I'll show you. Beeswax is used in many products, but candles are some of the most traditional. In fact, some churches require that candles used in certain ceremonies must contain at least 25% beeswax. Making candles from pure beeswax is really quite simple. All it takes is some sheet beeswax like this and wicks. You can purchase these supplies at some craft stores or from mail order beekeeping supply companies. Before I make candles, I just warm the wax in the sun until it softens a bit, 
or you can lay it on a towel lined cookie sheet in a 250 degree oven. It just takes a couple of minutes for the wax to soften, so it's workable. Next, lay a piece of the wick slightly longer than the sheet and gently roll it, making sure the ends are even. Of course, the more sheets you roll, the thicker your candles will become. Use a utility knife to trim the excess and a warmed metal spatula to seal the edge. It's amazing how popular candles have become, particularly around the holiday season. And to think, the essential ingredient here is from our friend, the honeybee. Earlier, I mentioned that a great way to add color to your garden for a party is to really pack in plants all of one variety into a container. Let me show you a few examples of colorful annuals that can really pack a punch when it comes to decorating the garden during the growing season. This petunia just knocked me out when I first saw it. It's called Supertunia Vista Bubblegum, and boy, is that a fitting name. The mature plant grows to 24 inches, especially if you feed it well all summer long. It was recommended to me that if you grow this petunia in a container, that you'll need to fertilize it regularly with a liquid fertilizer each time you water, but you'll want to dilute the solution by about half. Now this little beauty is called Intensia Cabernet Phlox. Just look at these fuchsia blooms, a favorite of butterflies. This plant is covered with flowers from spring until fall. It's a great choice for regions with high humidity and heat. Okay, enough about flowers. Let's talk about foliage. If you've ever grown heuchera or coral bells, you know that foliage is a beautiful thing. And I was really knocked out by this one called Dolce Key Lime Pie. The bright chartreuse leaves are what first caught my eye. It's a color that can give a shady corner or a container a real spark. Now another fun and colorful idea is to match plants to the fabrics and furnishings you're using. A vivid tablecloth, for example, can lead the charge. Maybe the cushions in your outdoor seats inspire you at the garden center. Or perhaps you have painted chairs, wild colors like these pink chairs I saw on a front porch. Whatever your inspiration, grab it and go for it. You're sure to find a colorful plant to fit any color theme. Okay, so you've decided to have a garden party. The invitations have been sent, the garden looks great. What about the food? Well, recently we caught up with Chef Rob Best. He's been catering for years and has some great time-saving tips for entertaining, as well as some menu options that you might want to try. What we're going to do today is we're having some friends for lunch tomorrow, and I'm going to walk you through a few steps that will save you some time in this busy world that we live in. We're going to do a bacon broccoli salad. Uh, we're going to have to cook the bacon to a crisp state, so I always suggest putting it in the oven and baking it on a sheet pan which is less mess on top of the skillet and you don't have to watch it and you can go ahead and do something else while you're doing that. Now and then the next thing we would do was we're going to bake a chicken salad pie which is our next item on the on the agenda. If you want to make your own shell that's fine. If not buy you a good quality frozen shell and then go around the edge and crimp the edge like this and you will have a nice pie shell that looks homemade. Because of the pie that we're making today is a rather solid consistency, we are going to block the shell so we won't have bubbles in it, which is what this is called. Or also, if you have some baking beads or dried beans, you can put them in it. Now, you want to pre-cook this for about 15 minutes in the oven until it's nice and toasty. Now, to go, we're going to go back to our broccoli bacon salad. And we're going to make the dressing, which is the mayonnaise into the bowl. This is a simple dressing. Then we add our apple cider vinegar, sugar to taste. I have a little bit of a sweet tooth. And then this basically is our dressing for our salad. Now we can mix this and we will put it in the refrigerator overnight and it will hold and it will be fine. You do not want to put this on the broccoli at this point. You want to set this aside and refrigerate it overnight. You do not want to put it on the broccoli because in the morning it will be a real lamp and will affect the taste of the salad. Now what you do to complete your broccoli salad at this step, you've cut your florets, you can salt and pepper now where there's a little moist so it'll pick up the flavor from the salt and pepper. 
I always find it handy in my kitchen to have a ramekin that has salt and black pepper and a little white pepper already mixed, and you can use it to season anything. Now to this, we're gonna add the bacon that we've already pre-cooked and diced up that was in the oven, and we're gonna add the raisins also to it. Now this just needs to get tossed, and then tomorrow, when we coat this, all the flavors will come together. All right, we're finished tossing the salad, except for the dressing. We're gonna set it to the side, and at the same time while you're doing all this cutting is when you would make your melon compote, and we have uh, chiffonade, a little mint to go with it, and put a little creme de mint on it. All right, now it's time to move forward to the hot chicken salad pie. What we have here is we've had our sauteed celery, onions, our boiled and chopped chicken, and to that we will add the rest of the ingredients that it takes to make the filling for the pie. The recipe calls for the filling for two pies, but obviously we're only doing one for our purposes today here. That's the mushroom soup. Here are the six hard boiled and chopped eggs. Then we're gonna add the rice. This is a bit too much rice, so I'll cut back some on the rice. So we'll add a little bit more of this other bowl of rice. We don't need quite all of that. And then we're going to add our mayonnaise. And what gives this a distinctive flavor is the lemon juice. Now we will stir this together thoroughly and we will start tasting for salt and pepper and adjusting it to where it has a taste that you like. Now, after we've got salt and pepper, we will stir it and combine the, all the ingredients so we get the consistency that we're looking for. This is, this is the last, one of the last steps that we'll do on the evening before our meal. Then we take and we move this into our pie, which we have pie shell which we have pre-baked. And as you can see, it looks like a homemade pie shell. Don't tell anybody, they'll never know. They'll think you're a whiz. After you get the amount of filling that you want in your home-baked pie shell, then this will go in the oven for about 30 minutes at 325, I believe is the temperature. And this is the last step that we'll do this evening before tomorrow morning. All right, it's the next morning and we're getting ready for our lunch. What we have is the uh, melon compote that we made up the night before. We've got some lemon bread that we've picked up just to accompany our meal. We have our pre-cooked chicken salad pie, which we're gonna to top with the cornflakes at this time. Now the cornflakes have been toasted with butter. And you just cover, uh, melt some butter, pour them over, put them in the oven, and toast them. Uh, if you're real brave, you can melt some butter and saute these in a skillet, but I would probably suggest just toast them in the oven a little bit. Now this will go in the oven for about 20 minutes to get it nice. It's done. What you wanna do is just heat it up a little bit and set the cornflakes a little bit. Now, the next is the broccoli salad. We made the dressing yesterday. We will put the dressing on top. Toss this and set it aside. And in about 15, 20 minutes, we'll be ready to start assembling our plates. And there you have it, a simple luncheon that you didn't have to spend all morning in the kitchen preparing if you do your work the day before. Well, that's it for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And I hope that you found some ideas that you can use the next time you have a gathering, whether it's for 200 or 20. Today we saw how creating simple and bold containers can help cut down on your maintenance before a garden get together. We met a designer who shared with us some of her ideas for creating outdoor living spaces at a Long Island garden home. We met an artist who creates garden inspired invitations. Plus we discovered some great time saving menu advice from Rob Best. From the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith.